today with Do Josh Diedrich, Managing Director of WindServe Marine, and Al Alcala, Sales Manager, Marine, Scania USA. So, Josh, to start, WindServe Marine has been a pioneer in the offshore wind sector. I know we've been we've interviewed you here before, but to start, can you give a short overview of by the numbers look at WindServe Marine today? Sure, Greg, thank you. Um, WindServe Marine, we are part of the Ryan Hour group of companies. It's a group of maritime companies, seven different companies, and WindServe is the offshore wind division. So right now, by the numbers, we have one purpose-built crew transfer vessel that we had built and delivered last year. And we have offices in New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, which we are working uh, with our different clients on future build projects. So right now we're really in the development stages of uh, building out our fleet of vessels. And that fleet will consist of uh, CTVs, um, SOVs, and then we'll be able to utilize some of our existing uh, tug and barge assets as well. Uh, well, we certainly know the WindServe Odyssey, um, as it was just featured in the Marine News Magazine as a what's in your workboat feature. Um, but can you give us a recap of the vessel, its technical highlights, and where it's at today? Sure. So the WindServe Odyssey, like I said before, uh, she was delivered in uh, 2020 by our shipyard Sinesco Marine out of Rhode Island. And uh, some technical highlights, it's a 64 and a half foot aluminum high-speed catamaran. Uh, which is typical for crew transfer vessels that are operated in Europe with a, a bow fender made by RGC site, which presses on to the actual turbine landing uh, there with a ladder. Um, we have a knuckle boom crane on the bow. Um, we have quad water jet propulsion with Scania engines. Uh, we have Cola Marine uh, gen sets on board. Um, we also have station keeping capability with a Hamilton jet anchor system on board, which has been really a, a good benefit for us at, at keeping station during different operations and also tracking a line pretty well during different operations. We have um, passenger seating for up to 20 personnel and those are all suspension seats um, in the saloon area. We have a galley area with some refreshment area, uh, two uh, restrooms with one shower in there too. Um, and then Going through that, that's kind of pretty much the, the technical highlights of uh, where she's going. We also have a pressure washer on the bow, but a lot of these highlights are, these are really, uh, you know, client focused. So um, as part of the project that you're working on, the requirements could change. So uh, we may be adding and subtracting some stuff from the vessel. And currently the vessel we have at our shipyard right now in Rhode Island, we're actually uh, modifying her. So we're upgrading to a uh, stern A-frame. So we're outfitting her right now with a stern A-frame and a dedicated over the side pole for some upcoming survey campaigns that we have for the spring and summer season. So that's where she's at now. Josh, well, we understand that the, that the Scania quad power solution uh, was selected to power the vessel. Can you just give us some insight? Why did you find that to be an attractive solution? Sure. So Based on our project requirements, we knew that we had to provide a quad propulsion vessel for redundancy and just client needs. So um, every project we look at based on the application for the vessel, we knew we needed a, a high-end, high-speed engine that met our, our engine tier requirements, our horsepower requirements, and also weight. So the Scania provided a really good uh, power to weight ratio. Um, we also, a big thing for us is we wanna make sure that the, the parts and service network is there and it's going to be there where we need it. So operating on the East Coast, we vetted the whole Scania network for service dealerships and distributors and made sure that on the East Coast, they were able to provide us with the service and parts we need. So most of the routine maintenance and repairs are done by our crew. So we're able to handle that uh, in normal times. But if there's an emergency and we need a spare part that we don't have in stock or we need a service technician to troubleshoot something that's kind of outside of our crew's range of competence, then we needed to make sure we had a good service network. And Scania has set up on the East Coast a very good network that um, we've tapped into and it really works well. And the best thing too, I think the biggest thing, and you can talk to any operator is, you know, spare parts. I need to be able to call and get parts. So oftentimes within 12 to 24 hours, and we need things to be expedited, FedEx, whatever it may be to get to the vessel in time, because downtime is the worst thing for us in our operations. So uh, we believed and we see it now with the operation that, that Scania was able to give that to us with the, these engines. Uh, we've heard from Josh uh, regarding the Scania quad power solution. 
but I'd like to, to hear a little bit from the Scania side. Can you walk us through some of the technical attributes of the Scania uh, quad power solution? Absolutely. Well, the, the number one thing is this is a V8 engine um, and it's made out of a CGI uh, material, which is compacted graphite iron. And what Josh mentioned about the lightweight, a lot of that goes to our design and how, how we build the engine. So CGI is about twice the tensile strength of gray iron. Because of that, we can use less material and it is still strong or stronger than our competitors' uh, gray iron engines. Uh, that means we're adding lightness to the design. And if you're into car racing, you know that adding lightness is another key attribute to speed. So because we're compliant with EPA tier three emissions, uh, you don't need after treatment, that saves weight. We can provide the flexibility with multiple engines, save weight overall in the design, and have a very strong, robust, uh, reliable product. Uh, some of the attributes inside the engine, besides what's on the outside, which is the CGI, are things like our, our standing liners, our saver ring design that help keep oil in the pan, uh, cut down a lot of carbon formation on piston rings lead to longer oil change intervals. So now you got less maintenance, less downtime for maintenance, and uh, you're saving some money. And anytime you have to do less maintenance, there's less opportunities to have to worry about something going wrong or needing something. So it, it's just overall building into the design of the engine, uh, a lot more reliable, robust, and flexible platform. Uh, and then as, as Josh alluded to, uh, a customer is able to do a lot of the work on their own or, or even our own process that we call our Scania smart support relies a lot on one service tech being able to do anything to maintain this engine or to repair this engine if it needs it. One tech should be able to do everything on that engine. Individual cylinder heads, they weigh 40 pounds each. You don't need an A-frame inside the vessel to take a head off if you had to. Uh, so there's just a lot of innate features that we build into it. At 800 horsepower, at 3,800 pounds, these engines are very power dense. And when you look specifically at the offshore wind sector, why is the Scania quad power solution attractive? I, I think it's because of our experience in offshore wind. So Scania uh, in the early wind farm days in Europe had a lot of exposure to this marketplace. And many, many of the first boat designs that were pioneering in this market were powered by Scania. Uh, our power dense design, our lightweight engines really lend themselves to this operation. Gives you more space and more capacity for crew and for equipment uh, in these operations. And what eventually happened is the size of the turbines grew, the size of the vessels grew, and they started going to a size of vessel that were beyond our horsepower range. Well, because of emissions in the United States, uh, it's all coming back to our wheelhouse. So the idea of a quad power uh, avoids costly after treatment, heavy after treatment, and uh, it just really brings us back to what we were great at. And now having four instead of two is our entry back into this market. And we already have the experience. Now it's just in a new, it's, it's in a new arena. What do you consider the greatest lessons learned in bringing the WindServe Odyssey to life? So the greatest lesson learned for us was definitely um, filling the gaps between the Euros, European design CTV and the US regulations. So um, when something's designed for meeting MCA regulations over in Europe, it has certain criteria for piping systems and shell plating and structure and things like that. And then when you have to comply to US Coast Guard regulations in America, certain things have to be changed. So that was definitely uh, the biggest lesson learned. And we knew it from the beginning, we knew it was gonna be something that we'd have to spend a lot of time on and engineering work on. So we did that diligently through the process. And then we ended up coming up with the Odyssey at the end, uh, you know, fully compliant with US Coast Guard subchapter L. And she's also a class with ABS. So it's the first class CTV in America. So that was also a, a big learning lesson too, just building this type of vessel to class and U.S. Coast Guard regulations in America. So it was definitely a good lesson learned for us. And uh, we've got the experience now and uh, have confidence in uh, continuing to do it. Can you put in perspective the opportunity that you see in the offshore market in the years to come? Sure. So the opportunity for a large number of suppliers up on the East Coast is, is very large. So we see it because... We just track it by the amount of uh, 
financing that's going into some of these lease areas and projects. It's very large and there's a lot of push for it. And then currently with the new administration in the White House, they're obviously pushing for renewable energy. And we know that there's all these wind farms that are getting permitted and leased. And the recent um, environmental impact study being approved for Vineyard Wind was huge. I think that just gives everybody in the industry a lot of confidence that this industry is going to move forward because I know that there were years in the past that everybody was kind of, uh, you know, questioning whether this was going to become a reality in America. But I think now with the permitting pushing forward and this first large scale project off of Massachusetts moving in the right direction, I believe the confidence levels back up, the financing is going to be back up, and then you have the supply chain. Um, that's eager to get involved. And it's gonna be, it's gonna take everybody who's in the supply chain to make this happen because uh, no one supplier can do it, whether they're an operator or a builder, whatever it might be, we're gonna definitely need to, to team up on this and um, get out to the market there to create this brand new industry in America. So uh, we're excited about it and uh, we're excited to see what the next five and 10 years brings. Al, the same question to you. What opportunity do you, when you look at the offshore wind market in the U.S. today, can you put in perspective the opportunity that you see for Scania? Absolutely, we 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 believe the opportunity is tremendous for Scania. The uh, the opportunity that Windsurf has provided us, uh, we hope to return by being very reliable and giving them a, a, an immensely productive engine that will help them get the, the most uh, productivity out of that vessel. Uh, we believe that from just in the past two days, different wind, offshore wind related webinars and one more tomorrow, uh, that the feeling in the marketplace is very positive. We believe it's about a 50 vessel CTV vessel uh, marketplace now, and it could grow in the next 10 to uh, 15 years, I think beyond that, but at least within the next 10 to 15 years, about a 50 CTV vessel. So there's gonna be a lot of competition, I believe in the marketplace. Josh is right, one, one uh, provider for anything may not be enough because there's gonna be a lot of demand. Uh, we believe that uh, standardizing on a quad design from Scania would help a lot of people have access to a very common experience across the industry where people will be very knowledgeable about how these engines work, how the vessels operate, and they can concentrate on the, the turbines themselves and the things that are important. Uh, and uh, we just think it's a tremendous opportunity for us, not only starting out now, but in the next year or two, I also believe changes in the propulsion technology are gonna be coming. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of discussion about hybrid technology. And uh, we are already working with all of our colleagues in the industry that make hybrid systems to make sure we are absolutely uh, plug and play with as many of them as we can. And uh, maybe even something from Scania. Uh, so Josh, do you have any additional vessels under construction? And I guess what more importantly, what would be the trigger uh, to order new vessels in the coming 12 to 24 months? Sure. So we are currently strategically planning right now. We've got a lot of things in the works um, at all of our facilities in New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island on, on multiple projects, working with different clients uh, for different projects. And as far as trigger, you know, obviously winning an award would definitely trigger the start of that. But then there's also the, the idea of building on speculation, knowing that the market is huge. So I think in the next uh, several months, uh, you know, we're hoping to make some new announcements for sure. But uh, in the meantime, I think it's just uh, it's definitely a strategic planning game right now. So we want to make sure we're doing the behind the scenes work now so that we are ready to go once those awards are uh, awarded.